my friends, this is our Joshua Collins. Please do share this video and subscribe to the channel if you would like. And uh, you can also join my Facebook group, Homeless Advocates for Christ, as well as Christians United Against Islam. And with that, uh, here's the video. Battu, violé, soumise au nom d'Allah, c'est l'histoire de Samia Sharif, une Algérienne qui a fui son pays avec ses enfants pour échapper à la violence conjugale et à l'intégrisme islamique. Elle se raconte dans un livre, Le voile de la peur. Samia Sharif, qui vit sous ce nom d'emprunt par crainte de représailles, a trouvé refuge au Québec il y a un peu plus de quatre ans. Josée Dupuis et France Desourdis l'ont rencontré, vous allez voir le reportage, qui sera suivi d'un entretien que Dominique Poirier a eu avec la députée québécoise elle-même, musulmane, Fatima Ouda Pépin. Samia Sharif ne porte pas le voile par conviction religieuse. Si elle cache son visage aujourd'hui, c'est uniquement pour protéger son identité durant cette entrevue. Samia craint son ex-mari, ses parents, ses frères, restés en Algérie. Elle a peur que quelqu'un ici la dénonce à sa famille. Qu'est-ce qui pourrait vous arriver? Ben, honnêtement, je vais vous dire exactement ce qui pourrait m'arriver, je ne sais pas. Parce qu'on m'a tellement fait peur, on m'a tellement dit des horreurs durant toute ma vie que si on t'attrape en tes gorges, si on t'attrape en, en, en te coupera la tête, si on t'attrape, euh, euh, on, on va te coudre la bouche avec du fil de fer comme, euh, comme on fait aux grandes gueules. L'histoire de Samia ressemble à celle de bien d'autres femmes victimes de l'intégrisme islamique. À 16 ans, son père l'a forcée à se marier. Son mari, qui avait le double de son âge, l'a battue, violée, durant des années. Quand je, je me plaignais à mes parents, je leur disais, il me bat, il me viole, il ne te viole pas, c'est ton mari. Pense en deux, laisse-toi faire, laisse-toi faire. De toute façon, tu es à lui, c'était s'il te bat, c'est parce qu'il t'aime, et puis euh, il veut t'éviter l'enfer, et puis... Dans le Coran, on peut lire ceci. Les hommes ont autorité sur les femmes en raison des faveurs qu'Allah accorde à ceux-là sur celles-ci. Et quant à celles dont vous craignez la désobéissance, éloignez-vous d'elles dans leur lit et frappez-les. Certains hommes interprètent cette sourate à la lettre pour poser des gestes extrêmes. Une femme pour un intégriste, c'est celle qui va, qui va le servir. Donc si un homme bat sa femme... C'est pour son bien, c'est pour qu'elle ne quitte pas le droit chemin. Et puis un homme est responsable de sa fille, et puis un homme est responsable de sa femme après. Donc, euh, s'il veut mériter une place au paradis, euh, Dieu, la première des choses, va lui dire euh, « Qu'est-ce que tu as appris à ta femme ?» ou « Qu'est-ce que tu as appris à ta fille ?» Samia, qui venait déjà d'une famille musulmane ultra-conservatrice, a vécu la montée fulgurante de l'intégrisme en Algérie durant les années 90. Je ne pense pas que je suis la seule à souffrir ou euh, la seule qui souffre à ce point. Je pense qu'il y a des femmes qui souffrent jusqu'à la mort. Ma mère me disait que pour être une bonne musulmane et pour mériter le, une place au paradis, une femme a trois endroits sacrés. C'est euh, la maison de ses parents, la maison de son mari et sa tombe. Mais un jour, Samia réussit l'impensable. Elle fuit l'Algérie avec ses cinq enfants. Ce qui m'a décidé, c'est mes filles. Je ne voulais pas que mes filles subissent ce que moi j'ai subi. Moi, j'avais peur de mourir et de laisser ma, mes filles là-bas. Ces filles, Nora et Melissa, qui portent aussi le voile pour protéger leur identité, ne se font pas d'illusions sur ce qui leur serait arrivé si elles étaient restées là-bas. Un suicide. <rire> un suicide ou un mariage forcé ou... Je ne sais pas. Non, non, je ne sais pas. On aurait très mal fini. Mais je trouve ça affreux, cet habit de pouvoir de la part des hommes. Et comment on peut se permettre de voler des vies comme ça. Et je trouve ça vraiment injuste. Toute cette violence subie, sa fuite vers la France, puis son arrivée au Québec avec de faux passeports et 200 dollars en poche, Samia le raconte dans un livre... Le voile de la peur, ce voile qu'on l'a obligé à porter en Algérie. Avec ces livres, voulu, euh, je voulais dénoncer euh, à quel point une femme peut souffrir. Je voulais dénoncer ce que mes parents m'ont fait endurer durant toute ma vie. 
Et euh, je voulais faire prendre conscience aux gens d'ici, les, les, aux femmes surtout, de la chance qu'elles ont de ne jamais connaître ça. Ce livre, c'est aussi une promesse qu'elle avait faite à ses filles. C'est vrai que le livre, c'était une promesse pour nous, mais c'est aussi une promesse pour toutes ces autres femmes qui sont en train de souffrir de l'autre côté. C'est important que le monde comprenne ce qui se passe de l'autre côté et prenne conscience pour que plus que ça se passe. Parce que plus on en parle, plus les gens plus écoutent les gens réagissent. et plus les gens réagissent, exactement. Il faut que ça se Thank you. My name is R. Joshua Collins, the founder of the Facebook group Homeless Advocates for Christ. And uh, first I'd like to read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 10 from the Holy Bible. Uh, from St. Paul, he writes, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. I encourage everyone to get the life to Jesus Christ with an idolater. That includes the Muslims. Um, you know, they're allowed to beat their wives and kill infidels. and That's what happens with false religion. A lot of women abused because of Islam. Um, and of course, fornication, sex before marriage happening all over the place. So the Lord can set you free from sin and give you forgiveness, eternal life. We've all sinned. We all need a Savior. So I encourage everyone to get the life to Christ before it's too late. Now I have some questions for the council. Uh, not answering these questions would be a great way to show you don't care about the poor or the advocates that are concerned for them. I'm hoping for better in the city of kindness. Um, but first, the question for the mayor and previous council, why did you outlaw sleeping bags, tarps, and other needed items for homeless survival in public spaces in Anaheim? What is the reasoning? Is this how to show kindness to the poor? Isn't this obvious class discrimination? So that's the first question. For Lucille, why did you create a dog park to kick out the homeless instead of a place where homeless people could find rest? Are dogs more important to you than humans made in God's image? Third question, for the mayor and previous council, if criminal activity among the homeless is really your concern, why do you target and outlaw non-criminal activity like having sleeping bags and tarps in public spaces? Isn't this an obvious attempt to remove all poor people from public areas, no matter what their background or situation? The last question for the current council, why are you not repealing these discriminatory laws against the poor and homeless? You've had plenty of time to do so, and it seems this discrimination you must approve of since you are doing nothing about it. Are you afraid to upset voters who hate all the poor? Please convince me that's not the case with your answer. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was just curious uh, regarding the cost of prosecution, you know, for the homeless uh, laws and things that you've passed. Uh, you know, you've uh, obviously been taking people's property and using city resources to do that, um, putting people in jail and using city resources to do that, um, you know, all the, the manpower to deal with all that. That's a lot of money and a lot of wasted money to, you know, go around criminalizing the poor and the homeless in the city. So I guess my question is, are you willing to change some of these laws so that you don't keep wasting all that money? And then what happens if you guys get sued and then the taxpayer has to pay for that lawsuit, right? So it's another way of robbing the taxpayer and bad stewardship when you make bad laws. So um, I don't know, it's a lot of millions of dollars that, that I see is gonna be wasted and a lot of the homeless are already suffering as it is and when you keep making laws that will hurt them or do things that'll hurt them, uh, it's gonna come back to bite you because God definitely promises to defend the rights of the poor. 
Saturday, February 27th, the day of the KKK rally at Pearson Park, he has a calendar entry which reads as follows, quote, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., cancel KKK march, Pearson Park, intelligence assessment shared, end quote. What a strange coincidence. Mr. Quesada's timeline matches closely with the information in internal police emails and confidential police reports. Police expected counter-protesters to arrive as early as 10 a.m. to protest the KKK, and the KKK told the police they would arrive at 12 noon and conduct a walking protest until 2 p.m. Additionally, later that Saturday night at 9.06 p.m., Mr. Quesada sent a, the Anaheim City Council, and Mr. Emery, by the way, an email entitled, quote, Pearson Park Rally Press Release PDF. The press release, written by Sergeant Darren Wyatt, stated the KKK arrived at Pearson Park at 12.10 p.m., a fact corroborated by multiple police reports. And yet, despite this information in being in Mr. Casada's hands, um, he got these facts wrong at two subsequent public meetings based 10 days apart. In closing, this experience has given me newfound appreciation for police oversight bodies. If the Public Safety Board didn't take the action it did last December, the, the city manager's Mr. office Robert, and the police department would have been successful in covering this matter up. But I'm wondering if it would have happened, if at all, if this body had been given more power at its inception, including subpoena power. And thank you very much for your time. Have a good evening. Thank you. The Anaheim City Council members are greedy, self-service, self-serving individuals who do not serve the people of Anaheim. Instead, they serve only themselves and those who pay for their elections, which are developers, the Anaheim Police and Fire Unions, and especially Disneyland. In exchange for political donations from developers, the Anaheim City Council members have permitted huge limited parking variances to any and all apartment builders. The present council members unanimously permitted almost no parking for building a 151 unit condominium complex a few months ago. Nevertheless, we have many stupid Anaheim residents speak at city council meetings to complain about the problems of street parking in Anaheim. They are like hens complaining to the fox about being eaten by the fox. <laughs> Council members give away to the police and fire units in order to receive tens of thousands of dollars for the elections. <coughs> Anaheim firemen get such outrageous benefits as 24 hour shifts where they get paid for sleeping. Anaheim police gets months of extra paid vacation for killing someone with a phony ineffective police oversight committee so they can get away with murder. As for Disneyland, Anaheim is presently hundreds of millions of dollars in debt from unnecessary giveaways to the Disney Corporation. In return, Disney gives hundreds of thousands of dollars to elect council members that allow the dangerous pollution of Anaheim air and water. 50 years ago, heart problems were the main cause of deaths in Anaheim. Currently, with huge amounts of toxic chemicals from Disneyland fireworks polluting the air, deaths from cancer are now the main cause of death for Anaheim residents living near Disneyland. This is a verifiable fact. Ten years ago, Disneyland promoted a toilet to tap sewer water program where Disney could save millions of dollars in landscaping water costs at their park. In the Anaheim Latino ghettos near Disneyland, drinking Anaheim tap water will now result in diarrhea in adults and serious dental infections for young Latino children. Councilwomen Lucille Green and Chris Murray agenda item discussing what Disneyland gives to and takes from the people of Anaheim should be included, should be include our polluted air and drinking water. Thank you so much. Raised to think of the police as people who were there to protect her from harm. But this belief ended when she became homeless. When the local shelter turned her away for lack of space, 
when she tried to use it, she was forced to live outside. But when she slept outside, she found that she was violating laws that made it a crime to sleep in public, even though she had no place else that she could, that, uh, no place else to go. Like most women, she wanted to avoid being outdoors alone in the middle of the night. It's not safe. <laughs> so when the shelter turned her away, she usually slept in the shelter parking lot, figuring that it was safer than venturing out into the surrounding canyons. She figured that if worse came to worse, and if there was danger, if she felt that she was in danger, at least she could pound on the doors, on the locked doors of the shelter, and a staff member could come out and help her. But police would pull into the parking lot in the middle of the night, and they would tell her to move along, to go somewhere else. They would tell her she was breaking the law by sleeping outside, but they didn't give her anywhere else to go because there was no other place for her to go in the middle of the night. She knew that the police weren't there to protect her then. Worse, they put her in harm's way. As she put it, when the police drive me out of the shelter parking lot in the middle of the night, it feels like they're telling me, yeah, go out there and hopefully you will get attacked and die. It will be one less person for us to worry about. So that's how these ordinances and the enforcement of these ordinances made Katrina feel. I think those of us in this room share a belief that what has happened to Ellen and Katrina is not right. We share a belief that all people have the right to live in dignity. That means having access to an adequate standard of living below which nobody falls. It means being free of government persecution and harassment for the crime, the so-called <laughs> crime, of being too poor to afford a safe, sanitary, and decent place to live. And such rights should not be controversial. In fact, they are enshrined in the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So on the international world stage, these are inalienable rights. And we're violating them in this country and in this county every day. In fact, too many of our elected officials do not share our values or our vision. We know that. That is one reason we are here. Too many believe that they can ignore the humanitarian crisis in our midst with impunity. In fact, too often they believe that they are more likely to get reelected if they punish, because I see these ordinances as punishing people who have no other choice, rather than respect their most economically deprived constituents. And so far, unfortunately, they may not be too far off of the mark, at least at the moment. And that is another reason that we are here today, because I have observed that there is still too much hatred and fear of homelessness outside of this room. There is too much blame and scapegoating of people with the greatest needs. For too many people, the persecution of those experiencing homelessness seems natural and even desirable, and I'm sure we've all heard it. I don't want those people in my park. I don't want them near my home. Just get rid of them. So we have lots of work to do. We're already doing it. One of our tasks, tasks is to change that narrative and in doing so to change the hearts and minds of both our elected officials and just the public at large, our friends and neighbors, our relatives. What we need is a social movement because social movements tend to bring about those kinds of changes. And in fact, I see a movement building. Those of us in this room are already speaking truth to power and many of us have been for many years, each in our own way. We are already telling our elected officials that they have it wrong. We already are demanding that they respect the dignity and the rights of the most economically deprived among us. The number of groups and individuals in this county that you represent and that are addressing homelessness is growing. And this growth brings us to a turning point, I feel. I feel that we are now at a turning point in this county. With the strength that comes from our numbers, we have an opportunity to make a really large impact. We have the capacity to change hearts and minds, and we can make it impossible for elected <coughs> officials to ignore us. 
we can help tear down injustice and create the society that we envision. So I know that some of us in our conversations with elected officials have been told by those officials, no, no, it's not possible. You're setting your sights too high. This is unrealistic. It can't be done. So should we not set our sights too high? Is justice too difficult in a place like Orange County? It's not LA County, people keep telling me. It's Orange <laughs> County. You can only expect so much. Are we asking for too much? Because sometimes it is what we're told. But consider this, and, and, and this is my little pep talk. <laughs> Think about the victories of past social movements. Voting rights for women, for example. It now seems as natural, inevitable, and unquestionable that women have the right to vote as the air we breathe. But none of this was inevitable at the time. The organizers, the agitators, the advocates of the past were railing against systems that had been around for generations, sometimes for centuries, when you think about things like the institution of slavery. For most people, the social order in which they lived must have seemed just as natural, inevitable, and even righteous. It took the vision of the dreamers and the fighters, the suffragettes and the abolitionists, the Underground Railroad, the Freedom Riders, the women's movement, the civil rights movement, the labor activists, <coughs> the progressives, and more. That is our history, to imagine the unimaginable what was unimaginable at the time and to fight tirelessly and without compromise to make their vision a reality. Change has always been the rule, not the exception. Change has always been the rule and it's up to us to make sure that that change goes in the correct direction, in the direction of justice. And so now today, it's our <coughs> turn to create change. I truly believe this is our moment. So our goals for the mini summit, again, are threefold. Ser one, to serve as an opportunity to build relationships among representatives of all of, our, all of the groups that are gathered here, establish some overarching goals that we can get behind, and to identify and commit to some actions that will show the county, show our elected officials that we are here, we are strong, and we are not going away. Through solidarity, we can create a social movement that is large, powerful, urgent, full of righteous anger, fierce, impossible to ignore. The need for our combined efforts has never been greater. I want to spend five minutes before we start our work for the day just going over the basic landscape of homelessness in, in Orange County. We need to kind of know where we are. Okay, so um, just I'll try to go as fast as I can. Uh, so what we have in common, almost as our fight housing the ultimate solution, we want decriminalization, youth engagement is the key, human rights is our platform, class warfare is leading, uh, leaving people exposed and vulnerable, and our decision makers are often driven by greed and it's up to us to reclaim basically our, our land, right? But what does it take? So we talked about education, uh, starting at a young age uh, in the schools, elementary, the school districts. Uh, peaceful disobedience, civil disobedience, uh, you know, if the Lord leads that way. People willing to give up more, getting arrested, maybe camping out if uh, necessary. Jobs, uh, also opportunities for the homeless. Uh, and, you know, educating congregations also to advocate. A lot of the, lot of the churches don't even know uh, what's going on with the homeless. They'll feed them and bring them food and stuff like that. They don't have a clue what's happening as far as the, the criminalization. So, we're, you know, working more to educate them. And policy change, you know, working for greater uh, advocacy. Uh, getting more people that are actually homeless advocating. You know, that's a big thing we were, we were talking about here. Uh, having allies run for office, um, ha housing, health care, uh, taking care of that. Litigation, of course, also getting, of course, keeping legal aid and everyone else involved, the media, uh, connecting uh, uh, free re resources also to the community. Um, so, I mean, who's our target? We just put city leaders, uh, trying to do uh, changes to the speaking ordinances, things like that. Oh, uh, board of supervisors, uh, society, the NIMBYs. It's hard to change a NIMBY, man, I tell you, that's for sure. But we've got all things possible. 
all decision makers, elected officials, Disney. And one thing I just thought about too is, of course, lobbying the Congress and Senate, you know, and, and hopefully you may work at the state level even and try to bring change. So that's it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Can we give a round of applause? Political power. This program will take a hard look at what we perceive as an ongoing drive for power. Not only the kind of power that flows from great wealth, but absolute power. A hundred eighty-nine thousand young women in Bangladesh who are sewing garments for Walmart. These workers are getting up at 5:30 in the morning. They brush their teeth with their finger using ashes from the fire because they can't afford a toothbrush. Forced to work from eight in the morning until 10 o'clock at night, 14 hours a day, seven days a week on these wages of 13 to 17 cents an hour. These are women who are hit by their supervisors, trapped in utter misery. As the largest company in the world, Walmart sets the standards that other companies are going to follow. So Walmart right now is sucking down standards all across the world. These are workers who have no rights. The outlook for this company today is very positive. In every country that we operate in, the Walmart model works. Because once your associates know that you will stand up for what is right, then when they see a wrong occur, they're more likely to contact you. And we have a very aggressive program underway to make sure, and have had now for the last couple of years. I was a global services manager uh, for Mexico, Central, and South America. My job function entitled three things. Uh, oversight of all factory certifications, which means you go in there and you make sure that they're humane working conditions. Big deal with the factory certifications is to make sure that the workers are in a clean, safe, humane environment. When I was in the factory and, you know, you talk to the people and the people were so nice and they were so good and they were just working for so little money and without any no condition of fairness whatsoever uh, with their compensation and their working conditions. I went back to my hotel room and just wept the first time. And you know, after dinner, I had picked up the phone. I was calling my wife and just telling her what I'd seen. And then, you know, I just started crying about that. You know, telling her she was like, "It's gonna be all right." You know, and I'm like, I oh, know, we're doing the right thing, but, you know, I just 
I couldn't imagine it was this way. I thought that a company like Walmart, once we started reporting the truth of what was happening in the factory, would take quick action to try and make the working conditions better. I believed in the mission and the culture which I thought existed at Walmart. I led more Walmart cheers than just about anybody that I know. Didn't even mind being the squiggly. I mean, if you would have cut me, I would have bled Walmart blue blood. I didn't know that we weren't going to make it the goal to correct the violations. And I didn't think that any retaliation would be brought against me for doing my job. I now I realize I was pretty naive, but it just didn't occur to me that Walmart would do anything except for the right thing once they were faced with the truth. I kept going into other factories and seeing the same things over and over again. And it became apparent to me that this was not an isolated issue. All you got to do is follow the money and the ones who are in power right now have tremendous pressure on them to perform like never before. The system was designed to keep the goods flowing to the United States. When push came to shove, they did not stand up and do the right thing. What really happened was they were getting fired for telling the truth about the factory certifications. And that was shocking. It was embarrassing, it ripped my heart out. To have all of that ripped from you and then to get sold out and lied to, Walmart let me down and when I needed somebody to look out for me, even though I was trying to look out for Walmart for years. Every child has the right to. It is easier to be ignorant and say, I don't know about the problem. But once you know, once you've seen it in their eyes, then you have a responsibility to do something. There is strength in numbers. If we all work together as a team, we can be unstoppable. 
Craig Kilberger. No one knows exactly how many slaves there are today, but a global slavery index by Walk Free Foundation puts the figure at around 30 million. The scourge exists in every country, but 10 nations alone account for three quarters of the world's slaves. Almost half are in India, where slavery ranges from bonded labor in garment factories to commercial sex exploitation. Next comes China, followed by Pakistan, Nigeria, Ethiopia. Russia, Thailand, Democratic Republic of Congo, Myanmar, and Bangladesh. Many of the enslaved are trafficked into prostitution, but far more are forced into manual labor or domestic servitude. They work in mines and factories, on ships, farms, and building sites, in hotels and private homes. Slavery is all around us. It's been linked to the supply chains of many everyday products. From shoes and bags to matches and soccer balls, it lurks in the commodities that fuel the global economy: cocoa, coffee, precious metal. Multinational supply chains are sometimes so convoluted and opaque that it's hard to pinpoint the agent or subcontractor using slave labor. From frozen shrimp to mobile phones, how can we be sure the products we buy weren't produced through human misery? What can businesses and consumers do to guarantee the things in our lives are genuinely slave-free? That there are more slaves today, worldwide, than in any other time in history. In Haiti itself, it is estimated that there are more than 250,000 children that are part of the Restavex system. Restavex are children that are often given away or sold by poor families in order to survive. These children are removed from their parents and sent to live with other families, where they are treated as slaves. We're not talking about child labor; we are talking about real slavery. The same type of slavery that also occurred back in the 1700s, children that are forced to work against their will for long hours in plantations or in domestic labor, where they are often abused by their owners and denied any form of education or basic help. This is a reality today in Haiti, a country that was formed by freed slaves and that yet has slaves today. The worst part is that slavery is becoming something common in Haiti. One out of three homes in Port-au-Prince, the capital of Haiti, has a child living in Restavec. This is mainly due to the fact that Haiti is unfortunately the one of the most poor countries in the West, and slavery ends up going unpunished, even though it has been illegal for hundreds of years. The poverty of the government doesn't have the capacity to fight this case. Millions of dollars have already been donated to Haiti, but it isn't enough. The problem is that there is very few awareness about this issue in our society. We interviewed more than 30 people, asking them if they thought slavery was abolished. 23 out of the 30 people we interviewed answered yes. Knowledge is power, and everybody needs to know what is going on in Haiti, so that slavery could be abolished once and for all. Slavery isn't something that people would just learn to have to live with. It has been abolished for hundreds of years ago, and it shouldn't be a problem now. By simply sharing this video, spreading it out to the world, you're already making a huge difference. Increase awareness so that more people will join this cause. The more people know about this, the better. Make donations, because there are children out there that are being sold into slavery by their families because they are too poor to raise them. Donate in the internet by sites such as freetheslaves.net, notforsalecampaign.org, abolishslavery.org, and many other organizations that are also in the fight against it.
slavery is wrong and it shouldn't go unpunished. Share this video, donate, spread it out to the world so you can also be a part of abolishing slavery. On this farm, we find Abdul. He survived three years of work. He's just 10. He earns no wages for his work, he says. Just food, the occasional tip from the owner, and the torn clothes on his back. Put in the simplest of terms, Abdul is a child slave. We move away from the group so he can speak more freely. And through our translator, he tells us his story. If he, if he had a choice, he wouldn't work. Abdul says he's from neighboring Burkina Faso. When his father died, he says, a stranger brought him to Ivory Coast. Abdul has never eaten chocolate. Tells us he doesn't even know what cocoa is for. We met Yaku on the same farm, also from Burkina Faso. My mother brought me when my father died, he tells me. Yaku insists he's 16, but he looks much younger. His legs bear machete scars from hours clearing the bush. The emotional scars seem much deeper. I wish I could just go to school, he says, to learn to read and write. But Yaku says he's never spent a day in school. Whether you're interested in the latest designer labels or just want something comfortable to wear, Clothes are a basic necessity of everyday life. But how many of us know the full story behind how our clothes are produced? In the former Soviet Republic of Uzbekistan, one third of the population are forced to work for the state-run cotton industry. Most are children. Schools are shut down as boys and girls as young as seven are made to work 70-hour weeks. <laughs> A lack of modern machinery means that the majority of cotton is picked by hand. And it's back-breaking work. Every child must fulfill strict daily quotas. Many students have said that we are like slaves. And we are tired, we want to go home, we are hungry, we are cold. Separated from their families, the children are housed in Soviet-style labour camps. With no access to clean water, Many risk poisoning, drinking straight from irrigation canals. Europe buys one-third of Uzbek cotton, contributing $350 million annually to one of the world's most brutal regimes. In May 2005, government forces ruthlessly crushed a pro-democracy demonstration, killing over 500 innocent civilians. The next time you buy new clothes, spare a thought for those who bleed and sometimes die for them. Ask your retailer where their cotton comes from. Only purchase organic and fairly traded products. Nanquang Garments produce clothing for Nygaard and Reebok amongst others. On the 4th of August 2011, 500 workers at the factory went on strike in protest to the company's ill treatment of his employees. The factory employs underage girls, a claim substantiated by the admission of a 15-year-old worker we met outside the factory. Call me 15 years old. She's 15 years old and she works in the factory? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. 
Okay. They pay per month $30. They pay per month $30. Yeah, yeah. Can we see her identity card on the camera? Can we see your, your card? They legally take these girls on in exchange for cheaper labour costs. Yeah. The grateful teenagers forgo their transport allowance, work long hours of overtime and accept a pitiful wage. The factory reportedly forces workers to do overtime, typically demanding between 10 and 12 hours a day, six days a week. Some normally he works for one day, he works eight hours, but yeah. normally she overtime until four hours more. Four more hours, so she works, so she works 12 hours yeah, a day? Yeah, 12 yeah. hours. The factory does not provide any paid sick leave. They demand that sick workers continue to come to work. This obviously hinders the recovery of the afflicted worker and encourages the spread of disease. The factory reportedly discriminates against pregnant workers. It recently dismissed two women for becoming pregnant to avoid paying for their maternity leave. These women now have no source of income with which to support themselves through pregnancy and to provide for their children.